Tēnā tātou, ko autahi te whitu tarake ki te rangi. Ko autahi te kura whenua, ki te kura wānanga i te whenua nei. Ko autahi ki runga, ko autahi ki raro, ko autahi o te whare wānanga e tū mai nei. Huri noa e te whare, tēnā o koutou. Koutou ko a tae mai. Koutou koa tae mai ki te matapaki i te tākoa putia mō tēnei tau. Aha koa he piki me nga heki o te wiki nei. Ko te mea nui, ko te oranga whānui mō tātou. Kei o kui rangatira, tēnā o nō koutou katoa. It is lovely to be with you on a raining Thursday evening. You are obviously dedicated to thinking about the budget and, um, or perhaps critiquing the budget when we get to Q&A. Uh, my name is Sasha McMicking, it is lovely to be with you. Before we can start talking about the budget, I have to do very important health and safety announcements. Uh, the first is that the Farupaku are just out that door and to the left. We're all from Christchurch, so if there's an earthquake, you probably know what to do. But there will be very official, young, beautiful people to guide you out onto an assembly area that is wet and muddy, but still very safe. <clears throat> uh, so th this lecture is part of the UC Connect series. And for the University of Canterbury, it's really important that our people contribute to our community. The whole notion of being part of the critic and conscience of Society is deeply woven into why we are here. So this opportunity to have a conversation on something that is so topical it's only five hours old um, is a really important part, I think, of the University of Canterbury contributing to our place in the community. So thank you for choosing not to have a cup of tea in your pyjamas and to come here and to give us the opportunity and the privilege to do what is fundamentally our job. And for tonight, I want to talk about the well-being budget, which will have been bombarding you on the radio station on your way here, and ask the question about, do we really have a well-being budget? What could or should a well-being budget look like? And to answer that question, there are just countless points of ambiguity. The first one is that we're talking about a well-being budget and we're talking about a living standards framework and most of those that don't spend their, si their time wandering Wellington streets don't really know how these two things relate. So what I want to um, do is to start with the living standards framework which is supposed to be the macro architecture that we understand well-being um, across government. I want to talk about how it came to be and where it exists in the world, and then talk about the budget and how well the budget reflects all of the aspirations in the living standards framework, or perhaps just giving you a, um, an entree into my conclusions, um, perhaps where it doesn't. So, if we're talking about a well-being budget, what is well-being? What is beauty? What is a rose? And does a tree really make a noise when it falls? They're all the same kind of question. They're philosophical questions that we can really only answer for ourselves. But a lot of people globally for a long time have been trying to articulate in a policy sense what well-being could or should be. So the first definition is from the OECD, who are doing a huge amount of leadership work internationally and in trying to define what well-being could be and to develop the frameworks that we could use to understand well-being and government policy. And it's a wonderful definition, but perhaps completely unenlightening, because it uses well-being to define well-being. That's the first problem. And um, it talks about quality of life. So some sense of well-being, some sense of quality of life. Does that give us any real understanding about 
what quality of life could and should mean to a government? Not really. So at least with New Zealand, we've gone slightly further than this kind of circular definition by having our politicians be really clear while still being politicians about what they think well-being means. But it, it's still not crystal clear. So the indicators we've had from government have been that first it's about widening our focus. It's about acknowledging that GDP is arguably just a means, it's not an end. So that if we're just looking at our financial performance as a country, there's a real risk of missing the point. So we're gonna widen our focus and we're gonna look at wider, bigger, different things. And that's where it starts to get back into the realm of the philosophical again. A Minister of Finance has been um, quite consistent in saying that to him, well-being means New Zealanders having the capability to live lives they value. And, and referring to living lives they value and having the capability to do so, he's really drawing on the work of Amartya Sen, who says that if we're going to realize the conditions in which humans have the opportunity to flourish, where human dignity is a real thing, then we have to have real choices and the real capability to give effect to those choices. But like all things that um, might resonate with our hearts on a philosophical level, how we do that is just enormously complicated. So if we're talking about people having the capability to live lives they value, does that mean it's about taking away barriers to things that frustrate people's choices? What about some of the really um, deep and troubling systemic issues, like our levels of disparity? What about, what does that mean in terms of how much we trade off having opportunities versus trying to generate outcomes that people experience? So we've got a sense from our government, but what we don't have yet is real clarity in the definition of well-being that we're talking about, which is kind of problematic when you're launching a well-being budget. So we've got lots of rhetoric, we've got lots of sense about, we're talking about enhancing quality of life somehow and in some way, um, but we're not really sure what it means. We're not alone in that. The entire globe is having the same kind of conundrum, but it does mean when we start to have this conversation about how do you know if a well-being budget is really a well-being budget, we've got to accept that we're all going to be talking about slightly different things. If we don't have an agreed definition about what well-being is, then we will all look in the mirror and tell ourselves what well-being means to us, but not necessarily explain it to other people. And it's gonna mean, as we've already seen in the five hours since the budget was delivered, people being able to debate what well-being is. Um, I'm not sure how many of you listened to the leader of the opposition's um, speech in response to the budget, which he took the opportunity to debate effectively it, were the things in the budget really about well-being or were other things more properly seen as well-being priorities? And if we don't have a definition, we can continue to have those political debates that take us nowhere but filling up politicians' lungs. So, uh, with, so if we're in the space of talking about well-being, I think it's really important that we both acknowledge that New Zealand is trying to take a leadership position internationally. And I think that that is something to celebrate. But in taking a leadership position, we're not the first movers. And in fact, we're building on hundreds of years of political exploration about how we create well-being within our societies. And this is a minimalist timeline that is woefully incomplete and the timescales are inaccurate, but it looks pretty. And 
Um, what I'm trying to show with it is when it comes to the conversation about how do we create well-being in our society, we can go back to the 1200s with the Magna Carta, where we had both a political revolution and a legal response to pressing debates at the time about what were the conditions in which human dignity could flourish. We can jump forward to the 18th century, and we did it twice with the US Constitution and the French Revolution and their constitutional response as well. And from that 18th century point, we had well-being as something that was understood in our political communities as something that was about liberty, equality, and fairness. They're kind of the base principles that sit at the heart of both the US and French constitutions. So from the 18th century, we were saying we will get well-being in our society if we have liberty, freedom, justice, equality, those kind of concepts. And then we, had, we jumped to the 19th century, and what we get busy doing globally is governments get busy making themselves. As the Industrial Revolution took, um, took its course, governments bureaucratized. That was one of their main responses to society becoming more complicated and having more dense relationships amongst themselves. And when our governments got into that business of bureaucratizing and employing civil servants and creating new government departments, we had a new set of values that came into play about politically, how do we create the conditions for well-being? We do things like the rule of law, and we ensure that our civil servants are independent and impartial. So we had a whole set of values about the nature of democratic institutions that were formed. So we have independent, impartial government that make sure that those dastardly politicians don't get away with too much because we've got clever people making sure that smart decisions are being thought about. And at that point, we continue to have a tension from the 19th century until now about what kind of values we're talking about if our goal is to create societal well-being. We're either going to be talking about values that represent the ends. So um, theorists would call them prime values. So their goals like common good and social cohesion and altruism. So some of us would describe them as the normative aspects of well-being. So we will have well-being in our society if we have social cohesion, if we have a common commitment to the common good, if we have commitments to sustainability, whatever that, that might mean as well. And then on the other side, we've got people who are relying on values like transparency and openness. If we have transparent, open, and accountable government, we will have the conditions for well-being in our society. And those values are the means, or instrumental values. If government conducts itself well, then we can trust the process, we can trust the integrity of the process to deliver a good outcome and good sets of well-being. And throughout the 20th century, those two positions kind of did battle. And we had various periods when the ends or prime values rose. So with all of our human rights instruments, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and all of the other human rights treaties that came along in response to civil rights movements and women's rights movements. Effectively, what those human rights standards were doing was creating a legal expression that it was hoped at the time gave effect to a moral consensus about the conditions needed for human dignity. Because all human rights standards are supposed to do is describe the minimum conditions necessary for humans to flourish. That's all human rights standards are. And then on the other hand, particularly from the 1980s, we had the rise of new public management, which was all about efficiency and rationalization. 
and it was very much about those instrumental values. How do we do things more efficiently, more effectively, um, faster and cleaner? And so those tensions, I think, are really important to see as we come into the debate about the well-being budget because they're the same tensions that we're going to keep talking about. And towards the end of the 20th century and early into this century, what started happening is a whole lot of organizations started trying to bring both of those sets of values together and a whole range of different approaches to looking at more than just financial things in response to well-being. And interestingly, it's not just government-related entities that have been trying to grapple with this notion of it's more than just money that we should be talking about. Business has been doing this as well. And I'd go so far as to say that the business community might even be a step ahead of government, but that could get me in trouble. So the, um, with that attempt to grapple with more than just financial metrics to define success, um, you can look into the business community, into the triple bottom line reporting or the quadruple bottom line reporting, and after that it just got unable to be counted. What they were trying to do was trying to recognize that if they were just pursuing profit without regard for social and environmental factors, they were going to have consequences like Nike being boycotted for using child slaves. Business worked out that it was dependent on the moral pulse of their consumers to do business. So business started trying to respond to a changing moral climate where we expected more than just good stuff done cheap. Where we expected things that contributed in some way to a world that we believed in, but at least didn't contravene the things that we considered to be right. And the, the government sector came along slightly later and started also trying to work out if we were going to measure success on a national or an international scale, would we do it in a way that was more than just GDP? Would we do it on more than just the financial accounts of a government? And if we were going to look at more than just the financial accounts, what would success really mean for a government? What makes a good country? And there were a range of indicators that, um, and frameworks. It was like battle of the frameworks. It really was, and I don't think the battle's over yet. Where we had a genuine progress indicator framework and we had some sustainable development goals. We had the OECD Better Life. We had some big international consulting firms that developed their own frameworks. And effectively what they were trying to do was find a way to articulate a common set of prime values. Which is really tricky, because if you turn to your neighbor, even if you happen to be married to them, and ask them what, how they would define a concept of well-being, or how they would define a concept of holistic success, they would say something different to you. So what all of these frameworks were trying to do was to find some way to wrestle with deep diverse values in a way that would get some reasonable subscription. And if you look underneath all of those things that were happening, I think it's important to recognize that there are different ways of a government trying to create greater well-being in society. So government can try and forge moral consensus. And we can look at all of the human rights instruments as a way of reflecting moral consensus at the time. So we have human rights protections for women's equality because society broadly agrees that that is something that is good. Still struggling to implement it, but we broadly agree that there's a moral consensus about it. Um, and so most of those legal direction, declarations are a reflection of moral consensus. But you can also look at the different frameworks and what they're trying to do. So if we've got a whole set of indicators about what well-being could mean, it gives us the ability to benchmark countries against each other, get a little bit of competitive spirit going on. 
fundamentally what they're trying to do is they're trying to change behavior within government as well as across society. So we create these frameworks because they are supposed to encourage our Crown servants to think differently, to make different options available, and ultimately for our politicians to have something to encourage them to prioritize things in different ways. So it's a behavior change aspiration. I think one of the things that is really important, somewhat missing, and going to be the main way I critique our budget, is about mechanism change. So if we've got some tools that help us create or sustain a moral consensus about what well-being is or should be, and we've got some tools that help us create some behavior change amongst our decision makers and people that um, give effect to decisions, what about the next bit about how we try and create social change? The next bit about how we try and create conditions in which there is greater degrees of well-being in a way that reflects our values. And pretty much at the moment, our language is really unsophisticated in this space. We've got this assumption that if we throw money at something that we value, that some good will come of it. There are very many shoes and very many people's wardrobes that prove that just throwing money in it does not mean you're going to wear those shoes. And the same goes when we're talking about a social change which has far greater meaning. Just because we throw money at it doesn't mean we're going to get the desired outcome. And part of the reason for that is how we think about implementing these values and these aspirations um, needs some work, which I'm going to come back to. So, and all of those policy levers uh, exist in New Zealand, but the one that is particularly relevant to the living standards framework is the indicators one. So the OECD has been doing world-leading work in identifying a range of indicators that they believe express well-being in a reasonably universal way. And what these pictures show is that um, the one with lots of windmills is actually rankings of countries against the OECD's um, set of indicators. And the larger blown up windmill is Canterbury. So the OECD has developed a whole range of indicators. You can go to that website, pick any region in the world, and it will pop up and show you how that region ranks against a whole bunch of well-being indicators. And this is the, the breakdown of where Canterbury is strong, average, and not so good. And um, which is interesting, and I, I'm sure you would love to debate whether that really is an accurate reflection of Canterbury, about whether when we look at ourselves in our collective mirror, whether we would rate Canterbury highly on civic engagement and jobs and life satisfaction and housing, particularly after the earthquake where our housing is not quite restored. And our potential desire to debate this, just a raise of hands, how many people would like to debate the scoring of Canterbury? Quite a fair proportion. Um, reflects the real difficulties with indicators. Because what these indicators do is they take broad concepts of well-being, quality of life, a sense of well-being, that means well-being, whatever that might be, and then they try and break it down into things that we can measure that in some way reflect the various elements of our views about well-being. So for the OECD, the way they approach well-being is that they've got 11 dimensions of well-being, and each of those dimensions has a key indicator. So things like air quality, pollution in the air is used as an indicator of well-being. Life expectancy is used as an indicator of well-being. Um, 
homicide rate, which is used as an indicator of societal safety. Voter turnout is an indicator of civic engagement. And um, life satisfaction. Understood, however, it is that people score their own sense of life satisfaction. And I, I think this is where we get to the, the first real challenge with using indicator frameworks to give an expression to well being is that uh, the indicators we use become the de facto definitions of what well being means. So if I said to you that in New Zealand, well-being means that we have high voter turnout, we don't have much air pollution, um, we live reasonably long and increasingly longer, and we don't have many babies that die at birth, and we all perceive that our life satisfaction is quite reasonably high, and we all have access to broadband. Access to broadband is genuinely one of the indicators of well-being. Um, would, would, how many of you would say that that reflects your values or concepts about what well-being is? Would it reflect your full sense of what well-being is? No. So um, all of these indicators are quite rightly part of understanding what well-being could be. But we know that the things that get measured get elevated in priority. So we've got this real tendency with these frameworks to try and drive behavior change, to create societal change that leads to greater conditions for human dignity to flourish. But they're compromised, in my opinion, by having indicators that have kind of got the soul stripped from them. They're good and they're sound and they're fair. But the concept of meaning, the extent to which we feel we have the ability, the agency to make real choices about our lives and to follow through on them, aren't reflected in air pollution and life quality. And um, the, the data technicians, who I share not much with as a human, but I very much respect their contributions, um, are, are really fixated on objective measures. So we have to have things like air quality and life expectancy to understand well-being so that they are comparable, so that they, there is consistency and stability, and that's how we get a good understanding of the data is we have objective measures like that. Whereas me, who's a humanist, says, that's nice, I want to know how people feel. And the data technicians at that point have an allergic response. Because that's not consistent. That is um, totally about an individual's perception. And not only is it difficult to be, um, compare against that, it's really expensive to collect that data. Um, because you have to talk to people and some of them don't have broadband, so you really have to talk to them. And it becomes ever more expensive. So in that kind of context, if you take the global picture as one where there is a global move to try and engage with well-being, that we've got two main mechanisms that are being used internationally, using the law to say what is a moral consensus or what could be a moral consensus, You've got indicators that are trying to drive behavioral change, but some of the potential of those indicators is compromised by them being less than soulful. That's the concept, context that the Living Standards Framework steps into. So the Living Standards Framework has been part of, it's been a work in progress for about 12 years. So this is not new, but it's become visible now because we've got this well-being budget. What the Living Standards Framework is designed to do is to be a macro framework that applies over everything that government does, which would mean it's not about a party political thing. It is designed to give us consistency across governments so that we can see a broad reflection of the things that New Zealand values. It's called the Living Standards Framework because it's supposed to be 
and articulation of what would heighten all of our living standards in a holistic sense. And um, the way it works now, it's evolved over the last six months, is it's got two parts. So it's got the four capitals, natural capital, human capital, social capital, and financial or physical capital. And they refer to the things that we need as a society to exist. Natural capital is our environment and all of the health and integrity of our environment. Social capital is about our levels of trust and cohesion amongst our society. Human capital is broadly about the talents and the potentials of humans in society, commonly measured with things like qualifications and the like. And financial and physical capital is about the money in the bank, financial opportunities and the quality of our infrastructure. So what the Living Standards Framework is trying to do is to say that all four of those dimensions are important to our ability to have well-being now and into the future. We have to have strong natural capital. We have to have an environment that will stain, sustain us long into the future. We need to have enough social cohesion and trust for social capital to have a sense of well-being. We need to have humans that have um, enough capabilities to do things and enough confidence to act on those capabilities and we need to have enough money and fibre networks and roads and things like that to be able to do the things that we aspire to do. And um, then the second part to the Living Standards Framework is to pretty much take the dimensions of well-being that exists in the OECD Framework and to apply them to New Zealand. The only real difference is that we've got a placeholder for cultural identity. We're not quite sure what to do with it yet, but there's a placeholder there for it. And the way the Living Standards Framework operates is that first it's a work in progress. So how it operates now will be different in 6, 12, however much longer. Is that um, policy, budget bids, go through a screening, effectively, to see how well they contribute to those dimensions of well-being. So, contribute, contributions to civic engagement, seems, sounds very aspirational. How will it contribute to environmental sustainability, income, cultural identity, notions of life satisfaction? So they go through that screening process and that's just woven into how government does things with greater or lesser sophistication at the moment because it's a work in progress and we'll come back to that. So if we've got this description, that is what New Zealand thinks is well-being, at least as interpreted by Treasury. Um, I was waiting for someone to heckle a punchline there. I wasn't going to offer it. Um, because they are good people in Treasury. The, the, so if this is how New Zealand is currently articulating well-being, it's all of those dimensions of well-being, plus a recognition that we need to protect and elevate the four capitals. There, there's a real question about how well this genuinely reflects what New Zealand people think well-being means. And that is a really interesting discussion that the Times says I don't have time to pause on. What the um, Living Standards Framework should do, what Treasury has said they want it to do, is to create greater alignment across government. So the, the first thing that we all know is that government works through silos. Police want to do something over here, might be completely related to what Oranga Tamariki want to do, but the chances of them talking is rare. So the Living Standards Framework first objective is to help all of government be aligned to the same priorities and the same values. And that's a really significant contribution. If it can just achieve that, in my opinion, it will have done something that is really valuable. 
The second thing that the Living Standards Framework is designed to do is to change the type of analysis that we get. It's based on the really common sense way of thinking that if we ask a different question, then we get a different answer. So if we just ask the question, what's the most financially sensible thing to do here, we'll get one answer. But if we ask the question, what is the thing that will create the greatest long-term environmental sustainability, the thing that will deepen the relationship between humans and environment, and be financially sensible, we'll get a really different set of answers. And um, finally, it's supposed to be a consistent benchmark that we can monitor across time, so that it can genuinely be something that is cross-party. So how does the Living Standards Framework relate to the budget? And um, th this is where there has been five hours of analysis, so you can take it as less than ideal, this analysis. I, I think when we look at the budget, there are a whole bunch of un understated tensions that we need to engage with. And I think one of them is the difference between well-being and welfare. And I, I think that we'll, over the next couple of weeks, we'll have a conversation about, is this a well-being budget or is it a welfare budget? And I don't think that they are completely opposite ideas. I think that they are related. Because if we want well-being, and if we accept that social cohesion is part of us experiencing well-being, then we need to address the things that are the greatest threats to our social cohesion. The greatest threats to our social cohesion are income inequality and all of the disparities that come from that. And we can look to Brexit or to the election of Trump to see what happens when there is unaddressed disparity. We get political polarization and Trump. We don't want that in New Zealand. So if, if we're going to have a society in which well-being can flourish, we have to address the threats to well-being, which are income disparity and lots of the really significant issues and challenges and harms that people are experiencing today. But we're at risk, I think, with the well-being budget as it's built, trying to conflate those two ideas. And I think, so these are the five priorities that were launched pre-budget and the budget um, aligns to. And I think that you can come up to halfway and broadly they're designed to do long-term approaches to generating well-being. And more on this side of the budget line, they're about short-term welfare interventions that are a sound immediate contribution to making um, a society that is more sustainable for well-being, but they're still different. Uh, that's the, the budget process, which is not very interesting and I'm running short on time. So I will just say that um, ministers are convinced that using the Living Standards Framework has changed the nature of the budget process. And there were a range of tools to help government officials do better screening of how effectively their budget bids contributed to well-being outcomes. What I think is um, really important if we're going to assess the budget against the living standards framework and our broader notions of well-being is to recognise that any government has very little discretionary money. Even though we're talking about huge and for me, inconceivable, I had to Google how many zeros billions really have, um, amounts of money. That graph to the left is using an actual accountant's data to reflect how much discretionary spend we really have. So like all of the graphs that are about to come, it's been prepared at high speed by a non-accountant, so please treat it as a pattern rather than being statistically accurate. So we have 
a commitment to a big concept of well-being. We have a big media hype about this being a well-being budget, which has created real expectations that this budget will be transformational. So as we go into this analytical part, I think the first thing is that no budget, no one-year budget, I don't believe, can ever be transformational because there's just not enough money that is not allocated to paying people's jobs or paying other ongoing fixed costs to make really profound change in one year. And the way that the budget has been allocated has got some really big ticket items in it. So this is just a sprinkling of some of the the budget commitments, which I'm sure because you were here on a rainy Thursday evening, you've all had some exposure to some of the headline commitments in the budget. So we've got really significant financial commitments to mental health intervention, really significant financial commitments to addressing child poverty. Um, what I want to do though is to, to try and break down what these funding commitments mean against three different things. So the first is across the different dimensions of well-being. So again, this is being done at speed, so please take it as a pattern rather than being statistically accurate. And it's, what it's trying to do is present a view about the relative prioritization of the different dimensions of our well-being. So we, the health determinants proportion is predominantly the mental health spend from this government. So this government has put financially reasonably equal priority on investing in mental health and investing in poverty alleviation as the main ways to generate greater societal well-being. We've got um, comparatively really little intervention in education and the environment is perhaps the, um, perhaps on a starvation diet under this budget, I think. And then there are a few things under multiple that defied easy classification in the time available. So when we look at this kind of graph, Really what we're being asked to think about is what do we believe the most important determinants of future well-being are? So do we believe that addressing mental health issues, which are very real and affect a really significant proportion of New Zealand, do we really believe that addressing that issue is the most important way to change societal well-being at this time and in the longer term. And academics talk about determinants. So what is it that determines whether you have greater or lesser prosperity? What is it that determines whether you are more or less likely to end up engaged in criminal offending and potentially incarceration? So with this well-being budget, what I believe the government has done intentionally and carefully has tried to identify what the determinants are that matter. And I think that, that is, uh, that's something I would absolutely commend. We've got a budget that genuinely tries to engage with the determinants that lead to good or bad outcomes. The question is whether they are the most impactful determinants that could have been invested in. And that I'm not so sure about. Then the next um, way to think about the budget is how we are spending it. The vast majority of this budget, like most budgets, is on building or buying things. Capital expenditure. Then the rest of it is where it gets more interesting. The next most significant fund goes into having more of the existing services. So with the mental health spend, for example, quite a lot of it is about extending existing services. It's not about creating something new. There is some of it that is, like the Mental Health Commission, 
but the majority of the next set of government spend is on taking the status quo and making it bigger. And I think that's really problematic. And the reason I think it's problematic is because most of the greatest challenges that we experience now are not new. So when we're looking at patterns of incarceration, for example, those patterns have three generations of history to them. Three generations where the same thing has been just progressively getting worse. Which means that those patterns have not only endured through the status quo, they have worsened during the status quo. So I am concerned about um, a budget that aims to be transformational, investing this much in growing the status quo. And the status quo will be doing good things. It's just I'm not convinced it's doing enough good, good things, well enough or fast enough. Which leads to the, um, the next bit of the pie chart, that slender slice on new services. So there is some money in this budget which is dedicated to doing some experimental things. Um, there's a lack of clarity about exactly what those experimental things might be, but the 98 million that is going to Kaipapa Māori Solutions for Imprisonment is one of those new approaches that we, at least from the way it's been built, can assume that it is not just continuing the status quo. There will be some new service delivery involved. Then we've got um, the next one, the black one, is about direct funding or some kind of cash transfer from government to business or individuals. Most of that spend is made up with direct cash transfer from government to business in the form of the new startup fund as well as in the matched um, savings for research and development, which isn't new, it's just a continuation and a growth. There's some direct funding transfer with the um, indexing of uh, benefits, but predominantly that direct funding is going to business. There's some of the budget which is going to removing financial barriers, like taking the fees off NCEA, and then there was some of the budget that I just couldn't work out exactly what it was trying to do because there wasn't enough detail or there wasn't enough time. So I think when we look at this kind of graph, the real question is, if we are trying to create transformative social change, is this the way we should spend money to create the most transformational change? And my answer to that would be no. So my scoring of the budget so far, and I'm not quite done, is that I would score it highly for intent. I would score it highly for thinking carefully about the determinants of well-being and I would not be so generous when it came to how the money is being spent. And then the, um, the final point, just for a bit of reflection, which really does show the starvation diet that natural capital is on. It's there, it's just so little you can't see it, despite the size of the graph. It's about the relative split between the four capitals that underpin the living standards framework. So physical, our infrastructure and financial resources, social things to do with social cohesion, human things to do with human talent and capability, and natural capital, our environment. And I was really surprised when this popped out from the Excel spreadsheet, given that we've got a Green Party Coalition partner. Um, so trying to bring this to some point of conclusion, I think across this budget we've got, uh, we've, we've got the reality that it doesn't matter how good an indicator framework is at articulating what well-being might be. That could be a fantastic description, but we've still got really deep existential and political debates about the next levels. So what are the determinants that will create the greatest impact in the, for welfare or for well-being? That's a debate which we have had since the beginning of 
humans becoming political. And no well-being budget will be able to overcome the different views, and I think also the shallow views about the determinants that matter most. I, I don't think we have enough quality insight into the determinants that will create the greatest well-being in a New Zealand context. And I think, for example, in the developing world, so there's lots of work that's been done that says if you want to create the most powerful social transformation, give women jobs in the developed world. Changes household income, changes gender inequality issues, changes the healthcare outcome for kids because there's more disposable income and women are more likely to invest it in the health and education of their kids. So um, it's not an absolute truth, but we've got lots of insights other places about the different types of levers and the different types of determinants we might want to focus on. In New Zealand, we've got far less clarity, I think. The second political tension we've got is that one between centralised and decentralised delivery. So anything that was on the funding the status quo graph was predominantly about funding centralised delivery by state services. One of the largest single investments from this budget is into Oranga Tamariki getting a new um, service function to work with young people who would otherwise have been dropped from state care. Oranga Tamariki will have money to pay for those young people to continue to be in Oranga Tamariki's care and there will be new funding for social workers to help with um, those young people not engaging in potentially nefarious activity that gets them locked up. So that's centralised delivery. Whereas we've always got the tension about decentralised delivery, and that's really where Final Water comes in. Final Water says, actually, we've had enough of government services. What we want are solutions that come from our whānau and that whānau identify, whether that's about um, creating, like has been funded by Whāna Water, um, new bilingual schools um, that are based at a marae, or things like that. So we've got an ongoing tension as a nation about to what extent does centralised or decentralised delivery relate to our various values on that issue. And then the third tension we've got is the time horizon. So if we're talking about well-being, which our Minister of Finance has openly done as a concept of intergenerational well-being, when we look at a budget, we've got to ask what the balance is between interventions that are designed to create short-term change and interventions that lead to sound intergenerational change. And that's a really difficult thing to do when the relative value of working with different determinants is at issue. It's also a really tricky thing to do if you're a politician who not only has to, as we know, think in really short time frames, but most importantly, if we were doing things that created intergenerational change, it would mean that an issue that we currently experience doesn't happen. And if you're a politician saying, I did this wonderful thing, which meant that 10 children didn't have a hungry day, it's just not, it's not a good sales line because you're trying to prove a negative. So we've got that, um, that political challenge about how do we balance into immediate interventions, which absolutely we have to do because real people are having real lives that are nowhere near our notions of well-being. So we have to do immediate intervention, but those immediate interventions don't necessarily lead to the greatest degree of intergenerational change. Which is why I would conclude that this budget has done some good things. And it is an interesting precedent because it's used a new process. It's been really intentional about the importance of well-being and it's changed our national discourse. But whether I believe that what has been funded will generate the intergenerational transformation that we're all hoping for. I really, really want to say yes, and I absolutely can't. I believe in the intention of this budget, 
and I am disappointed by the mechanisms that this budget has chosen to create social change. So on that basis, I would say that the well-being budget is not a facade. I believe in genuine intent. I believe in genuine good efforts. But it's not as much of an evolution as I was hoping for. Um, thank you. We'll open for questions with apologies for talking for slightly longer um, than I should have. This is being recorded, which means that there will be a microphone passed around. Thank you. I, I'm interested in the OECD measures and why we scored so low on education, please. Yes, that, um, that's an obvious one to go, but we're far more brilliant than that. Uh, the indicator for that is about qualifications. So apparently in our population at the moment, we've got a lack of qualifications at the right level for the OECD. Would you say it's a fair comment that this process is something along the lines of the managerialization of the political process? Surely politicians know what to do just by engaging in politics and listening to people. Why is this managerial style framework necessary? And I, so um, the question about is this managerial style necessary, I think it's a legacy of the 1980s and um, that what things like the Living Standards Framework are trying to do, whether or not they do is a different question, but what they're trying to do is to retract from some of that managerialism on one, you could argue it that way, or in another sense you could just argue it being a managerialism with more stuff on the dashboard. And um, as for a comment about what our politicians, um, don't our politicians just know what to do? I think that actually one of, this is of course the world according to me, I think that one of the reasons we have the social challenges we do is because we don't have enough imagination about how to create meaningful social change. And I don't think that our politicians are necessarily people with that imagination, and I don't think that most of our bureaucrats are either. So I, I think that we need... <laughs> I've still got friends that are bureaucrats, and I think that bureaucrats do really good work, but we don't employ civil servants to be imaginative. We employ civil servants to predominantly manage risk so that things don't turn to custard. So we can't expect people who have a job of risk management to be imaginative, creative mavericks who create new ways of creating, changing the world, effectively. Kia ora. Um, do you think all the dimensions are to be addressed in a budget? For instance, um, they could be addressed by regulation or law rather than a budget item. For instance, water in Canterbury, we could, we could enforce the present laws against polluting rivers and ban the export of fresh water to the Chinese. It wouldn't be a budget issue. Um, there's actually someone here yeah, much better qualified to answer that, but he won't thank me for dumping a minute, so I won't um, hand the mic over. Actually, those things are a budget issue, because if you want to do more law enforcement, um, or if you want to do more promotion about what the standards are or things like that, it actually goes into the budget as a, an operational expenditure cost assigned to human time. So a huge amount of New Zealand's budget is paying for salaries of people to do stuff. So that is actually a budget item. And yes, we have got other levers than just money, um, but we would still see it if it was a priority flowing through the money trail as well. Uh, so I was wondering if you had an opinion on how, how it could look differently in a way that you felt was more reflective of a well-being budget that was actually going to be constructive in a way that you feel would be you know, actually effective? It's a, um, it's a really fantastic question to come after me having a crack at other people not being imaginative enough. 
because um, I'm not sure I'm imaginative enough. When I think um, it, if, this, if the living standards framework was taken back to the beginning and we did it with a blank sheet of paper, I think the way that we would do it is, the way all of these frameworks work is their GDP plus some other stuff, is how we think about the world. If we were going to start with a blank sheet of paper, then I think we would take GDP off the table and say, actually, let's start with a blank sheet of paper. What is success? And um, I think we would end up with a really different result. And one of the pieces of work that we're currently involved with is working with Treasury to try and come up with a tikanga Māori approach to looking at well-being that would sit alongside the living standards framework or ideally um, come from within the living standards framework and fundamentally change it. And with that piece of work, we're starting from um, a different set of values, which I think will lead to an alternative to a GDP-based articulation of what well-being is. So that framework's called Hiaro Waiwara. And, um, sorry, this is going on late for little people. Um, it, it starts with a concept of why order to hold the essence of well-being, and then sitting around why order are four values: manakitanga, fanaingatanga, kaitiakitanga, and ohanga. Which um, so fanaingatanga is a, the values that relate to valuing human relationships and connectivity. Manakitanga about placing value on uplifting people. Manakitanga is quite often translated as hospitality, but that's a really rubbish um, translation in my view, because it's a, if you break down the word, it's about filling with mana. So manakitanga is about uplifting people. And kaitiakitanga, um, as lots of people will know, is about an intergenerational relationship of reciprocity with the natural environment. And ohanga is about intergenerational prosperity. So I think if if you started um, genuinely with prime values, so those are tikanga articulations of prime values um, that we're working on, what would that look like? How would that change our concepts in the living standards framework? How would it flow through to change all of the indicators? Um, so you could start with tikanga values or you could start with a whole set of other prime values. Any prime values on a blank sheet of paper, I think it gets to a different outcome what that looks like, we might have some better ideas in about a year. I think. Thank you for placing so much in context. Thank you. Um, we are governed locally by um, uh, regional councils, uh, city councils, uh, local councils. What amount of intent of well-being is disseminated and will take effect in that type of governance? Um, so, so, that's a, so there's two parts to that question that I'd like to address separately. So one is just the question of intent and the relationship between intent and well-being, and then the second about what's the responsibility of our local government in a well-being context. One of the um, global consulting firms that probably makes about as much money as New Zealand does in a year did um, some work on the relationship between intent and generating well-being outcomes. And under their framework, they found that Brazil, when um, this Lula da Silva, something like that, was the president, that there was enough intentionality from that political leadership that it led to um, real changes against the indicators they put into their well-being measure. And they saw the same thing in Poland and in another nation. And enough to say that the most important thing is political intention, which is another reason I think that this budget, in its highs and lows, scores well, because there's that clarity of political intention behind it. And then the, um, the second point about what's the role of our local government, there's um, obviously been different political views about whether local government should have contributions to a whole sense of well-being. 
um, the last government said no and took out those well-being um, dimensions. This government's putting them back in. Um, my personal opinion is that because well-being is so connected to our sense of community and local government exists in our community, I think that local government has more of a role in contributing to our sense of lived well-being than central government does. That's not how law or practice operates, but that's how I think it should be. Um, so for anyone that couldn't hear that, the abbreviated version is, was a question about how long will it take society to change? Looking at the difference between um, when the change that the war created versus going towards these things. And what the sociologists would say in response to that, and I'm not a sociologist, is that you have to have different expectations for dramatic processes of social change like a war or an earthquake or something that um, goes bang and the world is fundamentally different versus processes of incremental social change. And the main reason for that is that um, we've got both societal structures and psychological biases that make us want to hold on to the status quo. Um, if you look at society from a structural perspective, you'd say that everything in society is geared to be conservative and to make itself continue. And then on an individual level, we're known to have um, what's called a status quo bias. We would rather stick with the known than pursue the unknown. So it means that any process of incremental social change is going up a really steep hill because societal structures want to keep the same because humans, even when we say that we are rampantly excited about change, actually don't want change at all. There's been experiments done where um, you give an individual, an, individuals in a room chocolate bars and they have an opportunity to trade their chocolate bars. People who are holding a chocolate bar they don't like don't trade it, even if someone else in the room has a chocolate bar they really like. So um, creating this kind of social change um, is slow and painful unless we have things that come along that are dramatic points of upheaval. And so there's lots of philosophers going right back to Aristotle that would say, instead of fighting the status quo, just build something that's new and let that grow over time to progressively replace the status quo. But that's obviously a lifestyle choice. Well, I think, I, I think that building new things doesn't, is the faster route, and I am naturally impatient. Yeah. Decades ago, I heard the past noted anthropologist Margaret Mead, when she came to New Zealand, tell us that we could adapt to big things slowly or small things fast, but not both. And I think we've seen that with the changes of the welfare. I like your comments since 1987. I'd like your comments about um, something, thank you for the framework, but also what would fit the framework is the fact we are learning now about the importance of the first thousand days of a child setting their framework for their thinking and their values and their brainwaves. And I was thinking that if we really did have some focus on that first thousand days, it would meet your short-term change, it would meet the intergenerational change of parenting and grandparenting, because we know what happens to the grandparents is actually reflected in the grandchildren, because the 
their eggs are fully formed on their kid and so it goes on. Um, but it would meet the short-term change and if it was done decentralised with therapeutic relationships in the community and the whanau, it would meet that. And if we recognise that that parenting was the most important, vital job anybody could do and actually paid them to attend a weekly parenting centre for half an hour a week, a half a day a week, um, we could address all of those. What do you think? Um, so, so that question um, was about if we focused on the first thousand days um, of children, could we achieve all of this? And um, I've got two parts to that answer. Uh, the first is that I've got a toddler waiting to be put to bed, so I have to go very soon. And um, the, the second is absolutely. But the, the reality is that there was um, a trust that I'm only a couple of steps removed from in um, Southland, and it was called the Thousand Days Trust. And it was called the Thousand Days Trust because it was exactly what you described. It was a model of working with families for the first thousand days with therapeutic support, with residential support, working with the whole family, and um, it closed down after um, operating for about two years because it couldn't receive, it couldn't get any funding. So I think um, absolutely, I agree with that as a powerful intervention logic. We've, we've still got the challenge of these things that have powerful potential not being financially supported. So we will never know how effective that thousand days intervention was because the model didn't operate long enough for us to be able to do sound intervention. It did in Canada. Professor Fraser Mustard in Canada did this with um, parents um, attending for half a day a week, right through, followed those children right through primary school their um, outcomes were much more positive, um, not negative, et cetera, et cetera. Put it through the World Bank and the cost-benefit analysis was very definitely positive. Um, we've just got one more question down the front and then um, yeah, there is a microphone coming. Um, I just wondered if you believe that there was genuine intent um, from this government um, when they, in fact, have dismissed absolutely out of hand the capital gains tax? Well, that's a killer question to end on. <laughs> um, I, um, I, would re I don't understand the, um, the vast and unequivocal rejection of the capital gains tax at all. And I was really surprised by it and... Um, and, but I, I don't think that um, that being surprising compromises the integrity of the intent with the wellbeing budget. I think that's just part of um, our political system, in particular a political system that's still got Winston in it. Um, thank you very much for making the time to be here and staying later. It's been lovely to enjoy the evening with you.